the issue about the way we use our authority towards one another, the way we should be sensitive about the uses of power, and the converse of that, the, or the corollary of that, is about the fascination with nonviolence, has been a thread of CPAC's life and deliberations for a long time. Uh, another issue about the, the, the politics um, had to do with the acquiring of, of um, the Mackey building. Because in universities, the control of space is power. If you want to have a bit of power, you control. Look at, look at the prestige of the English department. They, they're mostly elderly and confined to homes now. Um, but they have, they have this massive piece of space. And uh, Ken and I were for years, Ken for about 50 years, I think, were elected members, were elected by, the, uh, by our colleagues to be on the governing body of the university. We were fellows of the Senate. So we were sitting around the table rather than knocking on the door trying to find out what was going on. And that, so that playing the politics hard in order to create uh, and sustain uh, a centre like CPACs was pretty crucial. Another piece of politics concerned, uh, so that this concerned even the opening of the gallery. And that's where I developed a theory about the relationship between snobbery and social change or not as crucial as the theories you've just been playing with, Peter. But um, I happened to meet Edward J. Perkins III, a tall, distinguished uh, American ambassador, and I discovered that he'd um, just come from Pretoria, where his close associate was Nelson Mandela, and I also discovered that he'd grown up in a... <laughs> did, did, somebody, did somebody throw that? <laughs> Uh, he'd grown up in Atlanta, Georgia, where his mate had been Martin Luther King. And I, at that point, Ken and I, we just acquired the um, Mackey building. I said, oh, well, we, we've got, we're going to open a Posters for Peace gallery. The place was absolutely filthy. We didn't have one picture. And he said, yes, I'd love to do that. I'd love to do that for you. At that point, when the university heard, this is the relationship between snobbery and social change, uh, heard that the American ambassador was going to come. They threw money at us. They painted the place. We got furniture. We got curtains. Dame Leone appeared and f four weeks later, and we had a splendid barbecue and so on uh, outside the um, outside the in in the in the uh, in the courtyard outside CPAX. Next piece of politics, uh, and I'll really came with the. The, the hardball business of persuading the university that Ken and I couldn't carry on as volunteers teaching an increasingly large number of students from literally from around the world. That um, I'd said to the Vice Chancellor, you're engaging in what is known as false advertising because the advertisements, you know, universities like to dramatize their virtues. The biggest institutions in universities these days are the institutions for boasting. You know, Sydney is better than Queensland, which is better than Macquarie, which is better than Melbourne, but Melbourne's better than anybody else. So um, we, at that point, we said, look, it's, we, this place doesn't have any resources. All the resources, almost entirely, are volunteers like Frank sitting there, like Ken, myself, and so on. And so at a really economically inauspicious time, we persuaded the powers that be to create the funds to appoint staff. Uh, Wendy is, is the first, I think Wendy is the first significant lecturer, and then the money for, uh, for a uh, director. And, uh, and the choice of uh, uh, Jake was, uh, was not unimportant, it was, was highly significant. Um, I'd like to say something about Liverpool Football Club at this week because that's really what uh, preoccupies Jake's mind, but um, he'll, he'll say something about that later. Let me go to the second point about the struggle for, for academic respectability. Peter has quite correctly uh, mentioned the first book called Beyond Deterrence, which was edited, was it not, by Gordon Rodley? Gordon Rodley was a close friend of mine. He was a former dean of of science at the uh, University of Canterbury. He was a well-published chemist and physicist. Um, and he gave it all up to come over to help me to sustain the Centre for Peace and Conflict Studies. He was a highly 
principled person um, in the in the in the occasion, the great occasion in the Great Hall when we paid tribute to him. Uh, my kids, in front of a lot of other people who'd been to our house, said uh, almost tearfully, "Dad, he was easily the most interesting person you ever brought to a, brought to our house," <laughs> which was a, a posthumous tribute to Gordon. But uh, not ex uh, exactly a slap on the back for other people. So the business of the struggle for respectability. You know, we've got this absurd competition across tertiary education around the world now, where people get graded and get numbered, labelled according to their worthiness, irrespective of whether the research is ever read by anybody. Um, but we did produce a series of significant books, Beyond the Market, The Alternatives to Economic Rationalism where in terms of human survival, the, the destructive nature of the uncritical commitment to free market economics uh, was a crucial theme in that book. Another book, The Human Costs of Managerialism, became a bit of a bestseller for us. It kept us in, kept seat packs in pocket money for quite a long time. The modest subtitle of that book was Advocating the Recovery of Humanity. Uh, that was quickly followed by an effort to get the multinational corporations to take human rights seriously. Given that uh, most of government, more than 50% of government, is run by multinational corporations, not by elected governments, if you look at the finances of it, that book, um, Human Rights Corporate Responsibility, was, was, uh, was uh, arguably rather important. In that, in that process of the struggle for academic responsibility, uh, a, a significant, significant mover and shaker was Professor David Weisbrot, who was chairman of the Law Reform Commission, but also pro, the pro vice chancellor at this place. And he came to me and said, you have a liquidity problem, which meant we, we, we got money occasionally, bit here, bit there, but we didn't have a constant stream. You will have to produce courses for students. You can't just exist on being a thorn in the side of the establishment, which was actually um, in our terms of reference. And so the wonderful Cheryl Minx, who's no longer with us, and I, we, we wrote the first ever course. We decided we'd do undergraduate, we'd do postgraduate. It was called Resolving Conflicts in Organizations on the, on the understanding that a great deal of conflict in, in, in many spheres of life derived from the failure to build uh, a culture of mutuality and reciprocity in organisations. Um, witness the state of the Liberal Party at the present time. And uh, we went on from that to, to write the, the basic courses, which at that time were two courses on um, key issues in peace and conflict studies. I think they've been boiled down to one third of a course now. I'm sorry, one in one semester unit. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, let me come to the last. So that business about the, the struggle for respectability is, is, is crucial. But uh, let me say that CPAX has always tried to walk the walk as well as talk the talk. The, 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 it's a complete con to behave as though you can have uh, great uh, academic respectability and you don't do anything. It's in particular in an area which is, for me, the, the most uh, intellectually, politically, spiritually fascinating because it crossed, namely peace studies, peace and conflict studies, peace with justice studies, because it covers just about every boundary uh, imaginable. So the, even the demonstration that Jake characteristically organized outside the ABC studios when the International Peace Research Association conference was held here, protesting about what, I can't remember Jake, what was it? Lack of balance in coverage of defence spending. Okay, lack of coverage, lack of balance in coverage of defence spending. Even those demos and our constant support, financially and otherwise, over so many years for the anti-basis campaign, that's been a central thread of CPAC's existence as well. I'll come to the last bit, which, which was about the courage of your convictions. It's really about drawing a line in the sand in a way, saying this is what we stand for, this is what we believe in, this is what we're going to hold to, because those qualities are highly unusual 
where everybody's trying to protect their own interests in, in the university cultures of today. First issue like that came up really in a conversation with uh, Muhammad Yunus, the founder of the Grameen Bank, I remember it in 1997-98, uh, when he had been chosen as the uh, inaugural recipient of the Sydney Peace Prize. And of course, the Sydney Peace Foundation and CPACs were Siamese twins, uh, almost inseparable, and a great deal of and the one has been a catalyst for the other, and long may that continue. Um, we'd already arranged the date, we'd already arranged the details, and then uh, Mohammed rang me up from Bangladesh and said, look, uh, there are not only floods in Bangladesh, but President Clinton is going to come. I'll have to change the date. I'll have to change the, make, change the arrangements. And <laughs> cut a long story short, I said to him, look, we made an agreement uh, that you would come then. I know there are terrible floods, but at the moment, President Clinton's legs are wrapped around some part of the anatomy of Monica Lewinsky and the sexual politics of the presidency is going to ensure that he ain't going to move anywhere out of Washington. There's no chance, Mohammed, that he's going to go to, Bang to, uh, to Dhaka. So uh, that, um, uh, and, and Mohammed at that point agreed, of course, um, uh, poor Bill Clinton, well, not was, Bill Clinton was preoccupied with that controversy for almost the, most of the latter part of his presidency. Um, another issue, another example of the courage of your convictions, which I think um, uh, CPACs has, uh, is known for, and the university doesn't really like it all that much because they'd like us to be respectable and clean and not involved in controversy, concerned our support for the Palestinian Han and Ashrawi. And, um, uh, that was, in some ways, both the Peace Foundation and CPACs have, if there's a stereotype reputation, people say, well, it's so, you want something to do with that Palestinian woman. And that went on, that controversy went on for about six months off and on, certainly for three months, because I had federal police protection for three months over that issue. And the fact that we, we didn't give way that we, we told that powerful lobby from around the world that we didn't give way on issues like that, gave us a reputation for being, in a way, official Palestinians. And Jake has continued that tradition in, his, in Andre and Ken and the Council of CPACs in their support for arguably one of the most important human rights campaigns in the world, which is the boycott, divestment, sanctions movement to, to um, to establish the Palestinians' entitlement to, uh, to self-determination. And the prosecution of Shura, of the Israeli law firm of Jake, uh, and the eventual knocking back of every claim that um, that law firm made uh, is another uh, valuable feature of uh, CPAC's tradition of having the courage of um, uh, of its convictions. I suppose the whistleblowing, this is the last point I'll make on that issue, almost the last point I'll make altogether. Um, the whistleblowing about the cowardly behavior of the university when pressured by the Chinese not to have the Dalai Lama on the campus is, is another example. Where did the Tibetan groups come to uh, when they wanted some support? They came to the Mackey building, right? As, as many, many groups all over the city and indeed over the state do. And uh, um, the rest is history. Remember, I went to the ABC, went to the 7.30 report, and that's a crucial part of CPACs. You have to have networks of contacts uh, across the city, across the state, with people like Meredith, but also with... Uh, with colleagues in politics in the pub, with the anti-basis campaign, with, with NGOs like Amnesty and Oxfam and so on. Okay, well, that's enough about um, uh, the courage of your convictions. Let me finish by giving a tribute to uh, CPAX in terms of the culture that it has built up. I think the support which students from all around the world receive from colleagues and from one another is a crucial feature of living and breathing and laughing and joking in that building. That is absolutely crucial to people's 
health and well-being, to their mental health, let alone to their physical health. If you don't pay attention to the fact that half the overseas students owe a fortune in debt to the university because it's really a business corporation these days, first and foremost, then uh, you can hardly be talking about peace with justice. And I think, although I think Paul may echo that, but the, the culture of support and reciprocity and laughter uh, and so on that's gone on for, for 25 years or more is a crucial part of that culture and doesn't exist when you listen to students from other places. Uh, the sad death of Astel Hines, a postgraduate student, prompted a large number of us to go to the funeral and to support our family, and a year later to make, a large number of us to make a pilgrimage to her gravesite. I know that's a bit of a somber note to finish on, but it's meant to characterize the importance of that culture. And I hope uh, if some of you young people, you lucky things are still here in 25 years time, you will report that the same culture still exists.